business of television, which I can get into in a little bit, but the business of television has changed quite a bit, and, and it's very hard to do what we do anymore in television. So we said, listen, you know, this is a story about people in their 20s. The new plot we were coming up with was all about the internet. Why don't we just do it for the internet? Um, so that was kind of, you know, so we just started all over again. Whole new story, everything. And, um, and sort of worked it out to be an internet series. And around that time, in my own ignorance, I was just sort of figuring out what social networks were about and trying them out and looking at them. And I began to feel that there was a place for a social network for people in their 20s who were artistic and creative, who were trying to figure out how they should manifest that in their lives. And uh, there was a little bit of ignorance at that point, because I didn't know that everybody and his brother was trying to create a social network at that time. And maybe that was lucky. But at any rate, we decided that along with the series, we would create a social network. And so we've kind of done these two tracks simultaneously since then for the past year and a half. And the, uh, the website went live just yesterday, as a matter of fact. And one of the things I want to talk about today is I want to encourage you to go on it. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Maybe we should talk about the show. And then yeah, I can and start you, the, just uh, talk a little bit about OK, what's happened in the industry is that in the late 90s, the FCC changed its rules about networks being allowed to own programs. And that didn't seem very significant to people at the time. But what it meant was that these six giant companies that dominate all media in the United States control and own all of television. It meant that ABC and its production wing, Touchstone, you know, created and broadcast all of the shows on ABC. And CBS did the same. And, and Fox did the same. And the result of that is that 10 years ago, there were 40 independent production companies in television making scripted television. Today, there are zero. They were all forced out of business. There are independent production companies making reality shows, but even they now have to give over half of all of their proceeds and all of their you know, it, revenue streams down the line to the networks. It's, it's a completely different world. And the result of that has been that the networks exert a level of control that they never exerted in the last 60 years of television. That my friends tell me now that the network tells them what color the walls should be on the sets and what the costume should be, and they give them notes on every line of the script, and it's a it's a different world. It's not the world you know where I started making my shows when I did my so-called life when I did thirty something. We never got a note from the network. We just did what we wanted to do. So, um, you know, it's been an increasingly hostile sort of atmosphere for us in terms of the shows we do anyway because. If you go on network television today, it's a very loud place. It's, you know, they want to promote everything to death. Everything is in primary colors. And, you know, the kind of shows we do don't really fit there. So this was in a way to say, look, is it possible to independently finance, produce, and distribute your own content on the net? And if we can prove that you can do this, then it means other people can do it. So back in Los Angeles, there are a lot of people in my business who are sort of betting on what we're doing because we're the first people who sort of stepped up and said, okay, look, we're gonna try to do a full-fledged series of the same quality that you would find, of, you know, the best stuff on TV or that, you know, look, I do my, I do my everything the same. When I do a movie, when I do a series, I do it the same way, basically. I do, do it the way I was taught to do it. And we approach this the same way. This is way more ambitious than anything that's ever been done on the net. It's way more expensive than anything that's ever been done on the net. It's still way cheaper than anything on television. We sort of worked out a way to, to cut costs and do it very simply. And it's all handheld. And we have these generalized lighting setups. But I don't care if it's dark. By the way, this was extremely dark. The show is not this dark and not this contrasted. This is that's just a D DVD. And, it's not color balanced anyway. But the point is, we figured out a model just ourselves. And, and we put up our own money to do this pilot. We called in every favor from the last 20 years. And, and, and the whole point was to own this thing, to own it, not just to get rich, because that could happen and that would be nice. But the only way to control something is to own it. So we have complete creative control and we have complete ownership. And that was, that was the whole goal. Because that's impossible to tell. So there's no one looking over your shoulder Nobody. saying, 
It's just me. We don't like this casting. We want I made all the decisions cast. myself, and that was that was the key thing. And if it fails, I'm happy to take the blame. So that was what propelled us into this. This has been a remarkable experience because I don't have to answer to anybody. Well, it strikes me that within the next five years, there'll be a new movement, essentially an independent TV movement. Right. That's what and we're hoping for, yes. That's just right. like the independent yeah. film movement. In that's right. But so by, by the way, though, these guys are trying to keep that from happening. Remember that. They're trying to get their hands around the internet just like they've gotten their hands around everything else. It's that. It's their nature. They can't help it. That's, you know, it's their corporate strategy. So anything that starts to succeed, they buy up. And you know, they're trying to show that you know, although it's cheap to make stuff for the internet, and of course it's cheap to put it on the internet, <laughs> but that's actually not true. But they want you to think it's true. So you know, it's it's interesting. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how successful independent television is on the internet. Well, the new statistic is that. On average, people watch 14 hours a week of television mm -hmm. and 14 hours a week on the web. Wow. So the web viewership mm -hmm. is now equal yeah. to that. Yes. This sort of divide of it. Right. So how will this? How will we be able to access it? It's November 11th. Is that right? But yeah. Here, here's here's the thing. We we thought long and hard about two different pathways. One pathway was. We try to make a show, we create our website, quarterlife.com, we put the show on that website, and we pray that people come. And we virally market it and try to get it up there and, and hope for the best, and which is actually what I wanted to do. But there was a harsh reality to that. And the reality was that these shows are incredibly expensive to make. And if I put this pilot up on my website, and let's say I, you know, I cut it into six pieces. And let's say I showed a piece once a week. In six weeks, I'd be out of programming. And in six weeks, I might have a thousand users. I'd be nowhere. I'd be dead. So the reality is, we had to raise money. And we either were going to sell out to a network or one of these companies, or if we were going to own it ourselves, we had to make a deal with somebody that would provide eyeballs and advertisers and that sort of thing. So even we. This is what I'm saying about how these big companies are still dominating this. We felt that we had to make a deal with a platform, that whether it was AOL or Yahoo or MySpace or Facebook or somebody that would put us in front of millions of people so that advertisers would come and spend millions of dollars and give us production money to make this thing. So after lots of meetings around town, the entity that was the most interested in working with us was MySpace. Now, MySpace is a social network, and we're a social network. And that was upsetting to them. They didn't like that. And they kept saying, why do you want to do this? You can have all your stuff right on us. And we said, yes, that's the point. We don't want to. Um, <laughs> and it took them a while to get their brains around that. But they actually accepted that. But the point is, so they the wanted to. So the Quarter website will have additional content. Well, it's going to have the show and additional and content. And additional content. Here's, right. what, here's what's going to happen. Here's the deal we made with MySpace. We own it. We control it. We deliver to them completed episodes. They have nothing to say about how they're made. They get 24 hours of exclusivity. So it goes on MySpace November 11th. Um, and, and one then on episode November, will be what is called one episode? Yeah, eight minutes. Okay. Just the, yeah, actually, the first night we're going to show two of those episodes because people don't really know what's going on until the end of the yeah. second. So, so we're going to show two of them the first night. But that November 11th, Sunday, it's on MySpace. November 12th, it's on quarterlife.com. Exact same thing, except we have a better player, and it's more high def, and it looks nicer. And we have a lot of extra content on our site about the show. Um, and then a week later, it can go everywhere else. We have deals with YouTube. It's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be on iMeme. So it's going to spread all over the net. But they have that 24-hour uh, exclusive window. And for that, they're doing a revenue split with us of the, of the ads that they sell, but they have no control and no ownership. And that was our, that was the thing that we were, that we most care about. So it, it'll be shown in these eight minute pieces. And by the way, if that doesn't work, we'll change it. 
I mean, one so of the, the Asian pieces will grow out every day? No. Or they will twice grow a week. Twice, twice a week. Twice a week, yeah. The first, like I said, the first night there'll be two. That's a Sunday night. Then Thursday night there'll be another. Then So Sundays and Thursdays on them, and Mondays and Fridays on us. There'll be a new episode. But by the way, the great thing about the net is if that doesn't work, if people think it's not often enough, if they're not you know, getting into it enough, we can do it more. We can do it more frequently. Um, we're shooting five more hours of these things. We're, we're shooting our fourth one right now. Um, so that will, you know, at twice a week, that'll go like three, four months. And so we'll have these six hours total. And then we'll see where we are, basically. It'll either work or it won't work. Now, in terms of the production of it, I know that you have a deal with SAG. Yeah, we, have a deal, we have a deal with every single guild. IA, Teamsters, all, you know, SAG, Writers Guild, Directors Guild. Um, this was something that concerned us. You know, I happen to be the president of the Producers Guild, which is actually not a union, but it's as if it were a union. It's a trade association, but still, we are aligned with all the unions. So it would have been very embarrassing for me to do a non-union production. Um, <laughs> so we had to make deals with all these people. And I was worried that they would beat the shit out of us, frankly, because we are, you know, the poster child for what's coming on the net. And everybody kind of, you know, when this announcement was made last month, literally within 24 hours, we were called by every union. And, and uh, you know, I thought they were going to use us to sort of force what, where they wanted things to go in their upcoming negotiations with the big production companies. Now, I was actually very scared about that. And it turns out they've been, they've been oh, great. Perfect. They've been really great because they understand that if somebody's going to be a guinea pig and try something new and try a new economic model, better it should be somebody like us and not one of the big boys. And so it's actually in their interest for us to succeed. So, so each one of them basically made a deal we asked for. You know, I mean, it's, yes, it's cost us more money, but not to the point where it put us out of business. So that part's good. Yeah, talk a little bit about the additional content, because all of the characters in here are artists in some way. They're filmmakers, yeah. writers, right. actors. Right. Uh, and you're going to actually extend this world onto your website. That's right. That's right. Let me talk about the website for a minute. Um, the website, like I said, it's meant to sort of talk about creativity and what it means to be a creative person. Also, to be a passionate person. There's a whole thing about activism on the site as well. There are, you know, life issues. It's not just the arts. But eventually, and I mean within two months, we're going to be covering probably 40 different art forms on the site. And what that means is that if you click on, you know, graphic design or you click on dance or photography, it's going to have Profiles of artists who do this sort of thing and where they talk in depth about what they do. It's going to have listings of schools and grant programs. We're talking to artists right now about, in certain areas, giving internships to people they find through the site. And also there will be a community within the site of the people in those fields where they can sort of talk to each other about what they do. So we're trying to give tools to people and resources to people to figure out how they can pursue these fields or how they can just sort of learn more about them for their own lives. Now, we're doing this show. For people who are interested in filmmaking and the entertainment business, there's a much more direct path because we're going to need writers and directors and actors and editors and composers and that sort of thing. So, you know, you know, for film students, there's a, you know, there will be a way to submit your material to the site for us to sort of consider. Then there's a whole other part of it that we're talking about on the site, which has to do with, I guess you would call it the depiction of life, the depiction of your own life. Um, you know, this is one thing. This is a six people. This is not what it means to be 25 years old. This is one version of that. There are a lot of different versions of that. What we're interested in is creating a community that talks about what it is to be alive, what it is to try to be an artist, what it is to try to make your life. However that manifests itself, whether it's music or, or filmmaking or, or, or poetry or blogs, whatever. And what we're saying very explicitly on the site is that our show is a very open architecture. Where characters are going to come and go. Characters are coming and going even in the second hour and the third hour. And you know, if we are 
magnetized to something somebody sends in, a storyline, a depiction of a life, or, or you know what somebody's going through in their life, or, or who they are, or what their brother is like, or something like that. We're going to incorporate that in the show. We'll give the person credit. We'll pay the person. We're not. We, it's not that we're going to use their content. It's that we're going to be influenced by that content. And we're and and the ongoing creation of the show will, in some sense, be a part of this community on the site. So it's a very complex thing we're doing. It's it's, it's not simple, and um, it's literally just starting right now. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to come around and go to colleges was that I wanted to encourage people of artistic bent to come on this site now. And believe me, when you go on there, it's rough. But we have some really cool stuff. Um, uh, one of the things that I love about it is we have this thing called a portfolio, which is basically a flash widget that allows you to put up your 25 pieces of content, whatever it is, photography, videos, writing, doesn't matter, music. And um, I guess the best analogy is sort of cover flow on, on iTunes. It doesn't look exactly like that, but the point is, People can go through and scroll through and see it and click on something and it becomes big and and it's a, and this widget can be exported to your MySpace page or your Facebook page and it's kind of a great way for people to present the stuff they want the world to see. Now some people will just do pictures of their dog or their friends or whatever and other people will put their art up there. Can people also interact with each other if I, if I find someone on the site? Oh totally. That's I mean that's really the center of the really? site is to create community. but. The reality of the social network, as you guys know, is it's fine when you're Facebook and you have 20 million members, but when you have 1,000 people or 500 people or 100 people, there ain't much there there. A social network is determined by you know, reaching that critical mass. And you know, what the experts tell me is that it's sort of around 500,000 users is when it begins to have a living, breathing life as a social network. So until we have 500,000 users, what we're trying to do is provide value to people and a reason for them to stick around and be interested in what we have to offer. And then eventually, yes, I want the community itself to take over. I want the community to talk about what the, what the opportunities are, what they're finding, what the schools are like, that sort of thing. I'd like to ask you something about this because in 30-something, two of your characters work in an ad agency. And, yes. and the idea of how you sort of, who you are and what you put forward uh, was very yeah. much a theme there. And it yes. is here too. And I, yeah. I just wanted to ask you about your, your own personal, yeah. you know, interest well, in and Maybe Stuart was doing before or something like that. You know, um, but it fascinates me, the depiction of reality and how you do that. Because finally, remember, Everything you do on film is fake. It's all fake. It's all an illusion. Even the movement is an illusion. You know, it's it's 24 still frames going by every second that make it look like it's moving. And I love the fakeness of it, and I love the evocation of reality. So, obviously, the advertising analogy sort of fit with what we were doing. And we, you know, we used to joke Ed and I when we were doing 30 something that there was a certain octane of truth that the audience could deal with. And if it got too high, they got really uncomfortable and they actually didn't like it very much. And if it got too low, then they felt that it was fake. And we used to joke that the optimum octane was about 92. It was about <laughs> 92, people just really didn't want to much watch here. it. Because you know? also, the truth can be boring. The truth can be uh, chaotic. You know, Part of the reason we write drama is to organize experience. But when it's too organized, then it feels fake. So you, again, it's all illusion. I'm giving the illusion. But you know, if you look at this thing, for instance, first of all, not one word in this was improvised. Everything was scripted. All the messed up sentences, the stopping and starting, it's all scripted. Um, you may or may not have noticed that everybody is in these floppy poses all the time. You know, She's got her legs in the air. He's lying on the edge of the bed, and he falls on the ground. And, they're doing all this weird stuff. I had to show the actors, I had to demonstrate all of those <laughs> positions for them. Because, you know, even though they're young and they're fairly inexperienced, you know, there's a there's a way most movies and TV are done that facilitates shooting. And that is you walk in and you stand up straight and they can do the over the shoulder and, and people stand, you know, directly across from each other. And it it it, it facilitates working with the camera, but it doesn't look like real life. So I had to sort of break them out of these ideas 
of how you're supposed to be on a set. Well, the sales girl does exactly that. You know, she says, I am walking back. Yeah, exactly. You know, it. Right. But I had to, you know, I had to sort of get them to loosen themselves up and, and do these silly things um, that look real, but in fact were entirely thought up in my mind beforehand, and I had to actually push them to do. So it's all an illusion. That's what I learned. I want to open it up to questions, but yeah. I want to ask you one, one last thing, because you said you were, you know, you're open to the possibility of writers coming from. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. you also did that even on 30-something. I mean, you created a lot of really great writers and directors out of your yeah. cast. Yes. So as a producer, you've been incredibly generous We've in had watching and, and thinking in that way. I don't think um, of it as generous. I think of it as self-interest. Well, <laughs> um, but, generously self-interested. <laughs> but we we had um, we had a huge number of first-time directors on Thirty Something. We always have. I'm, I'm a big believer. First of all, most television directors are just so you know ruined by the experience of directing television that I found it's much easier to teach somebody how to direct than to break the bad habits of somebody who's been doing bad work for a, a few years. So it was easier for us to use first-time directors. Um, writing is another thing. I find, you know, writing is, is, you know, most of what you need to know as a writer, you either know or you don't know. You can't be taught. The stuff that you can be taught is really easy stuff. You know, you either got it or you don't. And so you can be very young and you can have it as a writer. By the way, in these five more hours we're doing, four of those hours are being written by two writers, both of whom are in their 20s, who are you know, just coming to the business. One went to Yale, she's 24 years old. I had read a screenplay that she wrote, I thought it was quite wonderful, and I hired her. Um, you know, um, yes, we're big believers, especially in this show. Yeah. You know, um, my editor is 26 years old, never edited anything else before. He was the assistant editor on the pilot, and he proved himself to be brilliant, so I hired him. What? Were you also hoping that people would look at this medium in a fresh way? Because it doesn't feel like a TV show on the web. It feels like something very yeah, I did appropriate this to that medium. I did, it, I did it differently. And so was this issue of bad habits also? Well, you didn't want somebody who knew exactly how to do? Well, it's, it's funny. I, I just believe that each thing should be organic to itself. In other words, I shot this. I really wasn't thinking about the internet when I shot this, or TV. I was thinking about these people and this life and this world and what they feel like and how they dress and how they talk, and I shot it in such a way that it's in, that it's in keeping with how they dress and how they talk and how they move. Um, and, you know, and the only thing, the only thing that I have done to recognize the fact that this is going to be on the internet is I broke it up into these small pieces. Everything else, if I were doing a movie about these people, I would have shot it the same way. Basically. Can I say something that? I as a director, I find that this is the more refreshing way. The stuff that I see on the internet bores the shit out of me because it's me so too. badly shot. Me too. So because you approach this as cinema in a way, with maybe more close-ups than you would if you were using the big, big screen, mm -hmm. but it's so refreshing because it allows identification in the same way that when you watch a movie, and usually, at least for the stuff that I see on the net, Badly shot, badly put together, and so boring. You know, so using dramatic principles as you always have is, is what makes yes. this really strong. You know, it, for for good or ill, there is a cinematic grammar and language yes, that was developed it, almost a hundred years ago, and it was developed by people discovering that things didn't make sense unless you did it a certain way. And what was amazing when you think about movies developing in 1915 and 1920 and how these films would go around the world and people from every culture would watch these films and know exactly what was going on. Right, you know, the film yeah. language yeah. Is, a, is a remarkable thing and most of the stuff you see on the internet today is being made by people who don't know film language because they're amateurs and that's fine. They can do that. There's a place for that. place for everything on the net. But I believe there's a place for something that is more sophisticated yeah. um, and, and goes deeper in terms of storytelling. Um, I was wondering if you could actually talk a little bit about the casting process for yes. this, and if you ever considered using more like recognizable actors, or if it was always going to be unknowns. And then also, if you could talk about the process of like reworking the script that you were talking about, reworking the the show uh -huh. for the internet, and, and how you started to right. do that. 
Well, in terms of that, I'll answer that first. We threw out that first script. We threw out the whole story. In other words, if you were to watch that, it bears no relation to this. There, it's, a, it's completely different people having different circumstances in their lives. So we just started from scratch in terms of that. In terms of casting, um, casting is mostly about hard work. It's mostly just being really persistent and dogged and looking everywhere. And you know, it's something I am really proud of. We found some great people over the years for our shows. And, and you know, the main way you do it is by not giving up. And that's what happened here. Now, I didn't really, I didn't really want to have recognizable people for this, and it really didn't matter to me. But it wasn't an issue anyway because no recognizable person would have worked for the amount of money that we were able to offer. I mean, we were paying everybody a hundred dollars a day, from the top to the bottom. Every actor, the craft service, everybody got a hundred dollars a day. Favorite nations. All favorite nations. Favorite nations. Yeah. Everybody. Across every category. Every category. Right. Um, except me, I wasn't paid anything. Right. But everybody else got $100 a day. And, um, and so in TV is such a competitive world. Any actor who has any kind of a profile is trying to get that pilot, trying to get that series, or trying to get that movie. And they weren't going to put themselves in this thing for $100 a day and, you know, and sort of go into obscurity. So we were in this position of only being able to look at unknowns, but I was kind of happy with that anyway. You know, the main thing was, could they act? You know, did the camera love them? Which is not the same thing as to say, are they beautiful? It's, but are, you know, and did they seem to fit in the same universe? Because a lot of ensemble casting is matchmaking. You can find a great actor, you can find two great actors, but they exist in two different psychic universes. That's no good. So I had to put together these people who, who seem like they fit together in some way. Um, and you find, by the way, the girl who plays Dylan, I met at jury duty. <laughs> um, you know, and, and was so struck by her and, and uh, thought she was so smart and interesting and, and, and became friends with her and sort of a mentor to her. And, and the, you know, I had already written the script when it, it was like that one day in Los Angeles when you have jury duty. You have to go and sit in a room for one day and pray they don't call you to be on a jury. So if you're lucky, you get out after the day. So it was that one day. And I had already written the script, and, and I was sitting there talking to this girl, and I kept thinking, is she Dylan? Is she Dylan? And there were some ways that she was, in which she was like how I saw Dylan, and some ways not. But she just stayed in my mind. And when we started casting, um, you know, I, I must have looked at 30 or 40 actresses, and, and she came in and read, and she was just better than anybody else. So. You find people in the oddest places, basically. Was that, had she been on Lonely Girl? No, that was after. She did our thing first, and then she was on Lonely Girl. She hadn't done anything, uh, basically, when, uh, when I found her. Yes? Um, from what I understand, you're broadcasting this over different platforms of MySpace and then other social networks as well, drawing people back to your site. Yes. Your life. Hopefully. And beginning, uh, like your own social network, completely separate of the existing one. Yes. And seeing as that's a trend, people are trying to carve out these niche communities. Yes. Um, have you, is there a way to integrate your page that people will represent themselves with? Yes. With existing sites that they have on other, in yes. other communities? Yes. Or do you have to start from scratch? Uh, that's a good question and it's something we've thought about a lot. Basically, there's going to be a big sorting out in the social network world, just like everything else, and, and a lot of them are going to go away. And ours might go away. Ours might never fully get started, who knows. But we believe in it, and we're going to try to make it work. The, the, um, the portfolio, which is the central part of each person's profile on our page, like I said, will be exportable. So you can have your quarter life portfolio on your Facebook page or on your MySpace page. Um, but I don't, other than that, I don't think they're really integrated to restrict the content on the site less than is restricted on other sites. Because I feel that if people are artists, they should be free to express what they want to express. If you're a photographer, you should be able to put new photography on the site, if that's what you do. And this was really important to me. Um, it turns out that that is just an absolute nightmare from a legal standpoint and from a financial standpoint. 
that, um, first of all, if you have nudity on your site, what happens is you get flooded by sexual businesses, pornography, um, prostitution, that sort of thing. So you need a huge admin staff to sort of keep them off, let alone decide what is pornography and what's not, and do you care? Then you have this issue of that you have certain legal responsibilities. You have to verify people's ages when, you know, if somebody says they're 17 but they're really 12 and then their parent sues you. Um, you know, we were sued, uh, we, we were in the midst of a lawsuit by two writers who claim we stole The Last Samurai from them. And they sent us their script when we were already three weeks into pre-production on the movie. And our, our legal expenses on that lawsuit so far are now $250,000 on a completely frivolous lawsuit without merit. And we still haven't even gotten to court yet on that lawsuit. And it'll be thrown out the first day of court. So the point is, you know, when you're in a business like this, you need an insurance policy that covers you from frivolous lawsuits. The minute you have nudity on your site, the premiums for that policy jump literally by a multiple of 10. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting there going, I can't afford to do this thing that I wanted to do, which was to say, this is a site for adults. It's, it's for people to express themselves however they want to express themselves. I can't afford to do it. Now, eventually, maybe I will, or may eventually I can have a sort of part of the site that is, uh, you know, more restricted or by subscription or something like that where I have less limitations on content, that sort of thing. But now I'm kind of in the same weird place where YouTube is and MySpace is where I now have to start throwing people off, you know, if, if a naked breast appears, it's like, I didn't want to be in that business. I, I'm, I, it's sort of Who's weird. Who's going to monitor? And it, as people post their, whether it's <coughs> paintings or films yes. or whatever, it's are you then required to have a full-time A huge staff, yeah. a huge staff of admin. But basically, people complain. What happens is people put stuff up and then it's complained. People complain, it's abusive, and then you pull it off. So, yes? Um, I guess the question is, could you have a separate section um, I grew up in an artist colony in Boston, and in order to be a resident of the colony, artists had to provide their portfolio to be considered an actual artist in their field. And could you maybe have a section on the website that is specifically for artists that they have to actually send in a copy of their resume so that you as a person decide that you are an artist, a valid person within your field? In other words, it would be more restricted in some way. It would way. be more restricted, but uh -huh. it could be similar to, you know, you have an open space and a private space, and you uh -huh. have simply the artist space. Yes. So it doesn't, make, it doesn't actually exclude a huge portion of the population, but it does make it so that you can put more private things, or at least more um, artistically, yeah. you know, relevant Daring. things. Yes. On a certain section. We're talking about that now. Uh, you know, it, you know it, that what you're saying is very similar. I said... I mean, this is a terrible name, but I said, what if we had Quarter Life Professional? Do you know what I mean? It's like, in other words, what if we had a site that was by subscription, even if it was $5 a month, that just, you know, that, that just said, because the minute you have a subscription, then you can verify people's personal information, that sort of thing. So you're more legally covered that way, and, and we, could, we could restrict who the users were. That's something we're talking about, but that would be in success. That would be probably a year away. It's just not something we have the resources to do right now. That's all. But I, I really like that idea, and I think we will, we will eventually try to go in that direction at least. Yes. Um, can I just ask for you what is the sort of end vision? It's one thing that excites me about the possibilities of the internet is you take the end vision of say something like Quarter Life becomes very successful. You know, and this show becomes successful and has viewers, and people join the website and you get to that five hundred thousand mark. Then what? Does it become a, a, a sort of internet studio, or like, you know, where does it go? Good question. Uh, my dream is that this works, and we get enough advertisers so that you prove that you can make money doing this, and it becomes a platform for other people, so that. Uh, you know, somebody comes to me and says, I want to do a series about this or this, and I don't want to have to answer to a network and that sort of thing, and we put that up there. Or that it shows that other people can create their own platforms in that way. Um, I'm pretty political about this stuff, and I've, I've been radicalized over the years. I, 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 uh, I'm really very um, 
pessimistic about where things are going in the entertainment business right now. I, you know, I, like I said before, I, I think these corporations are, have done tremendous damage, and I think we have this opportunity at this moment, and I don't think it's going to last that long. In spite of the size of the internet, these people are really smart, and they and their aim is to really try to sort of grab as much of that real estate as they can. So if we can prove an independent model, I think it's going to be great for everybody. Yes? Um, I have a question back to the, the format of the show. Yeah. Uh, or the, the length specifically. Yeah. How, when you, the way it seems to me is that like when you have like a 30 minute chunk of programming, it's like a significant amount of time that you can look forward to it. Yes. Um, so to keep people sort of anticipating the next episode. Uh -huh. When it's 10 minutes, how do you how do you foresee you know keeping people interested to mm -hmm. the next episode because it's only in the end a 10 minute experience. So uh, how do you That's a big problem and I don't know the answer and that's why I am really open to the idea of changing this uh, changing the format because it may not work. You you may be absolutely right and I also believe that's why I think that it would be better to do this three times a week than two times a week for just that reason. That, you know, if you're watching 10 minutes and you know in two days you're going to see another 10 minutes, you might feel better about it. You might be willing to sort of invest in it more. Or it might be that we have to show these at a half hour at a time or an hour at a time. You know, I'm open to any one of those solutions. And, and you know, the, the good thing is that we can find out. You know? will, will they be archived on the site? Yes, so they'll let's be say if I hear there. about this in December, I can go back. Absolutely, they'll all be there. Up. Yeah, they'll all be there. Or I could do a marathon. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I had that same question, but also, um, in addition to that, how uh, are those downloadable, or are they just streamed? We have a deal with iTunes. They're not downloadable on these sites. They're streaming. Of course, most people have figured out how to download that anyway, but we won't talk about that. But we have a deal with iTunes. And we're still working out, um, it's funny, I just got an email yesterday. I was assuming that it would be available on iTunes once we had aggregated an hour's worth. Once, once six of these episodes, uh, then it would be available on iTunes. iTunes is now asking whether they can do it sooner in smaller bits. I don't know if that makes sense, and I'm going to talk to them about it, but they want to get it out there soon. So, but it will be downloadable that way. Um, will people be able to update their pages or upload things from their cell phones, or do they have to do it on a computer, or can they do it? That's a good question. It, uh, I would say pretty soon we'll be able to do that, but we don't have that capability yet. We're just, you know, what, we are what we call in an alpha stage. We're not even in beta right now. We're in alpha, so so that's that's a bit down the road, but we will have that. Yeah. Yes. Have you during the growth stages of this community considered? open source or wiki technology? Say that again? Uh, open source, yes. like the wiki, wiki technology, which allows people to... I understand. To, you know, is this, you consider that at all? Or? It's, that's, that is there. In other words... It is there. You in other words, when, when you... And by the way, it may not be there right now, but it will be there by, by launch, that, that, for instance, we have listings of schools. You know, you'll be able to add schools. You'll be able to comment on schools. You know, th yes, we want the database on this site to to be to to be a wiki where people can add to it and participate in it. Yes, that's that's a big part of our thinking. What else? Yes. Yeah. Just um, or like, where does the profit come in to this? Like, is it? Is, are you charging for subscriptions or no? Um, the pro the uh, it's an ad based model, and we're taking a big chance because no one has ever, as they say, monetized uh, content at this level before, this expensively. Um, however, we've made these deals with advertisers that um, cover our cost of production so far. So in this round, we're covered. It, you know, it has to succeed, or else they won't give us that kind of money going forward. And there's a whole issue that we had to get into that I'm sure you could see in this having to do with product integration um, that has been a very complex and at times baffling issue for me. For instance, they do a Toyota commercial in this at a Toyota dealer. Okay, well, I wrote in the script that they do a local car company. So I said to my people, well, let's go after Toyota because at least they make hybrids. So we went to Toyota and we said, can we use your cars? They said, yes. 
they gave us a, a Prius. Uh, we had no contract with them, no money changed hands. They just gave us permission to use a Prius. Uh, I said, can we have a dealer? They said, we don't control our dealers. You have to do that yourself. So I went to this dealer in Culver City, and I got on my hands and knees, and I begged him to let us shoot there for $1,000, and he said yes. And so that's how that worked. But that wasn't really a product integration. Apple is all over this. Um, uh, we went to Apple, and we said, first of all, do you, are you interested in this? Do you want to put it on iTunes? Do you want to advertise on our site? We had meetings after meetings with Apple. They loved the pilot. They decided that they would give us a bunch of equipment for free, including editing equipment that's not on screen, um, but a lot of the stuff that's on screen. They decided that they would make an iTunes deal with us. They're going to promote us in their stores, but they paid us no money, and they're not doing any ads. That's just what they're doing. We're making deals with a couple of other advertisers um, who may or may not be integrated into the show in very subtle ways that probably won't even be noticed. Um, but it's tough. It's weird, because I grew up hating that idea and thinking that advertisers were the devil. You know, but now, I'd rather be in business with an advertiser than with a network, because <laughs> the advertiser is giving me the money. I can choose the advertisers, and they're not telling me what to do. They're seeing what I do, and they're buying it, or they're not. They don't. They don't have any say over it, you know. So, and by the way, in the second episode, I have this new character who's very political. Who, you know, you know these guys finish the commercial and they screen it for their friends, and this guy says, yeah, well, it looks like a commercial. And they say, well, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, you know, um, it's that commercialization of life, you know, corporate hegemony, you know, uh, exploitation of third world countries, addiction to material possessions. <laughs> he completely trashes the whole idea of advertising. Now, I'm just doing that on the show. No advertiser is telling me I can't do that. So <laughs> I'm just doing what I do, basically. Right. How much, uh, can we talk about the budget? I can't, I'm not allowed to what talk. What about, just yes. you talked about maybe one episode in general, like, yes. A you know. shitload, how about that? Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> many of us make independent films, and yes. we've been working with budgets anywhere from 250000 for a feature yeah. to a million for a feature. So yes. we're talking, you know, and Indigent, a company that yes. was started, you know, a couple of years ago. I almost ago. did this with Indigent. Indigent is a really yeah. interesting yes. place. In fact, I used the Indigent model, model. to, That's what I was to do the pilot. So. And, and I became close friends with Gary yeah. and Jake. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, it's expensive. We did the pilot. We did the pilot for around three hundred thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. Each episode costs way more than that because you can't get people to work in a sustained way mm -hmm. at that level. So, without going into the details, it's a lot more than three hundred thousand for each hour. And you know, if you look at programming that's been made for the internet, most of it is very, very cheaply done. So this is we, you know. We're trying to prove that you can bring in a lot more revenue than people have brought in before. And our theory is that if you offer more, you can get more. And no one has offered more before. So that's what we're trying to do. Are you to hoping, do. too, that the union contracts are templates for other? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the point is, as we start to make more money on the internet, then we can pay people more. So. I don't want them to be a template set in stone. I want them to be a template for people who are trying to do something and, and, and seeing if there's a model there. That's, that's, that's what I'm hoping they give us enough rope to hang ourselves. Yes? Just to put it in perspective, I don't know, what's a normal TV pilot cost? Well, a normal TV pilot costs about $5 million, and a normal TV episode costs about $2.5 million. So we are significantly, well, I mean, it's a joke. The pilot's a joke, but our episodes are significantly under half what it costs to make a regular TV show. And that means we're paying people less. And But also a lot of other things are simplified. We have smaller departments. I don't have a wardrobe department. You know, and it, what are you shooting on? We're shooting on prosumer, uh, the Panasonic 200 DBX. Right, right, right. It the it's model. 720 lines. It's um, you know, semi-high def and easily handheld. And uh, cameras, working great for us. And more you, cameras than one? Two for, cameras all the time uh -huh. on P2 cards. P2 cards. And uh, it's working great. We have these very easy, simple lighting setups. Mm -hmm. you know, And so we move very, very fast. Mm -hmm. That's one way we save money. Right. But we don't, we don't skimp on performance. In other words, 
what's great is there's almost no setup time for camera or lighting, and I can take the time with the actors. That part's been great. So, yes? Um, do you almost imagine this as a, an independent network that exists exclusively online that could become something like that? Uh, you have other shows as you mean if it, You mean not just online? Well, no, uh, as an online network. Uh -huh. As a network similar to the network that we have, not, you know, not in a greedy sense, but right. um, in that if you have a, a set series of shows that you have online that you can go to yes. a specific place to look for. I, yes, I do see that, but there's a limit because I don't want to work that hard. <laughs> in other words, if I I would love that, and that's what I want. But it's here's the thing: I don't want to create an empire. I would love to create this thing that makes it safe for other people to do the stuff they want to do. And by the way, Ed and I in our careers have done that for people in our shows. We because we had a particular relationship with the network. We could protect other artistic people from network interference. That's impossible on television now, even for us. But if I can perform that same function for other people, that's great. But also that means that somebody else can say, oh, OK, I'm going to start my platform. I'm going to do that as well. So it's not like I want to become another News Corp you know, or another Time Warner. I just want to sort of create a space, make a living, you know, prove a model, and, and sort of sort of make it freer for people. That's what I want to do. So, yes? Uh, yeah, uh, to what extent is watching the show um, important to participation in the social network? Um, that's a really good question, and we don't know the answer yet. And, and that's going to be determined really by the users. And I have a feeling that there's going to be a, a, a continuum. In other words, there are going to be people who don't give a shit about the social network and only want to watch the show. And there are going to be other people who don't care about the show and are only interested in the social network, and a lot of people in between. And that's going to have to sort itself out. And in our planning and our thinking and our design of the, of the site, trying to figure out how much of the site is devoted to the show and how much is devoted to the social network and how do they intertwine. There's a lot of questions we've had, and, and I don't know if the answers are even right, but, but you know, you'll see when you go on there kind of how it delineates, although the show's not up yet. so. Will there be extensions on the site? For example, will we get to see her complete blog? Yes. Or will that? Yeah. The show page um, has a lot of ex extra material on it. It has blogs by all the characters, more blogs by her. We're also creating, we're experimenting with creating materials beyond the show if they're of interest to people. In other words, sort of these people in their lives. We're going to see how that goes. It may work, it may not work. But, you know, I've always been curious my whole life when you watch a movie, it's like, well, what happens when the person leaves this scene and goes over there? You know, we're going to try that out a little bit, but if it's not good, we won't continue it. But we'll, we will have a lot of extra material and also a lot of the behind the scenes material. A lot, again, I'm blogging on the site, I'm being interviewed on the site, the writers are being interviewed. We're talking about what we do and why we do it and how we do it, and, and so that to make this process available. Does your work with Stafford sort of? Generating some of that idea. I mean, Stafford has that 